I really do appreciate the songs that we've sung tonight, and uh, that's been true all week. I'm grateful for the talents of those who have led them and for the encouragement I've received from those in the audience as we have uh, edified one another. I appreciate the prayer that was prayed, and I'm grateful for your presence. I want to say thank you, and I don't have much time to do it, but I need to tell you that I am so thankful for this week and for the time that I've had with you. I told you when I came, I knew of this church. I had never been here before. I knew Brother Rader. I read after him for years and uh, had been, you know, helped by his work. But uh, I didn't realize that actually we know several that are here. Um, Sister DeMombrio, of course, we met her uh, a number of years ago uh, up at Westview in Murfreesboro. And uh, the Stricklands, we worshiped with them in a meeting over in Georgia years ago, and folks from Pepper Road, and folks, and of course, Mark. We uh, have known Mark for a long time and uh, met him years ago in West Virginia. So it was great to see uh, folks that we hadn't seen in a while. And it's great, likewise, <laughs> to be able to meet folks this week and people that have all kind of connections that we knew about. But I want to say thank you. I want to appreciate especially Mark and Miss Tricia for uh, the warm way in which they have received us and it's been a great blessing. I appreciate so much feeling so welcome there and so at home there and it's been a really fun week and a very good week for us and we do appreciate and love them. And I appreciate this congregation. Um, I've been here a whole week, so I'm an expert in everything now, right? What, uh, what kind of help can you get from a guy that walks in off the street? Uh, well, you can decide about that. I just offer this thought quickly for whatever it might be worth. Uh, it looks like you've got a lot of good things going here. You certainly have a lot of uh, advantages I think you have uh, very able teachers. You have very uh, committed and, and capable leadership here and your elders and obviously, at least it seems to me, there's great respect for them uh, among the congregation here. Uh, you have a location, you have a facility uh, that's uh, really impressive and a lot of open doors. And I, I wish you the best in, in the years to come. I haven't, uh, I haven't been auditing this week in that way. I imagine you've probably got some problems. I don't know any congregations that don't, and certainly one of this size, uh, likely you'll have some. I'll offer this little thought before I get started tonight with our work that we need to get to. Can I say to you, my wish for you and my prayer for you and whatever the problems might be in this congregation or wherever you might be from, make it your commitment to be a part of the solution, as the old saying goes, and not part of the problem. Uh, you know, it's not that difficult to spot problems. There is some value in that. And it's certainly not difficult to complain about problems. There's plenty of that that can go around. But if you will help these elders to help this church grow, and if you'll make it your commitment that as you see things that need to be done, not just pointing it out and lamenting about it, but trying to figure out what can I do about that? And how can I help that? If we've got weak folks, how can I help them be stronger? If somebody needs a friend, how can I be their friend? If there's talk going on that shouldn't be going on, how can I make that unwelcome in my corner? And how can I build folks up instead of tear them down or whatever it might be? If we all together have that commitment, you have talented people here, and if this congregation has that spirit of love and family and the weak things, we'll just try to make them stronger and we'll love each other and work with each other. I think that with these shepherds, you're going to have a lot of things that uh, will be very great in years to come. And uh, I certainly pray that for you. And I ask your prayers on our behalf. I told you earlier, here we are down at North Bibb in, in Alabama. We got a church that's never had elders and two guys never been elders, and I'm one of them, so they, you can tell what kind of shape they're in. 
And um, we need your prayers as we're fighting the same fight. And Lord, help us to do it in a way that he'll be pleased with. But I appreciate everything that's done for me this week. Folks have taken us into our home, meals, all kind of kindnesses, the kind words and, and, and the questions after the lessons that I really appreciate. Appreciate the way you've listened and your patience through these studies. And it's been a, a great blessing for me and for my wife. My wife Donna got to be with me this week. That doesn't happen every time. Uh, but it's always great when it does. I, I've told several people this story and you've, if you've been observant, you've seen it to be true. Um, people, they tolerate me. They like Donna. And so she's, I go to places sometimes that I've been before, they'll say, Donna, not with you? And I said, well, no, can I come anyway? And we have to flip a coin on that one. But uh, it is great, and you've made her feel very welcome also, and I know she appreciates that too. We are talking about the wisdom literature, and um, that was an ambitious uh, choice. I realize it's so practical, and so I need it so badly that I just can't resist sometimes if I get the opportunity to do that. And so we spent some lessons Sunday in Proverbs, and then we talked about three lessons in Job. And then last night we began our study of Ecclesiastes, and I know you'll be shocked, I didn't get finished with what I wanted to say. And uh, actually I actually had a couple of people ask me about that, which was encouraging. Uh, you know, you going to finish that? I don't know, Brother Rader, I'm sure this hadn't happened to him, but it happens to guys like me. Sometimes you'll set out and I've got a three-part series on something, and I'll preach the first two, and then something will happen, and I'll delay the third one, and nobody ever asks about it. And I think, well, I guess that just mattered to me. But uh, so when somebody says, you're going to finish, I, I just can't resist it. But so I spent the morning chopping in again and trying to get the material down to a, some reasonable level. But I do want to go back, maybe where we left last night, and then get to something this evening, and we will try to finish in a very reasonable time. I, I must say this. Uh, you got young families here, and the young moms and dads who have uh, hung in there with me this week and have fought the fight. Love you, and I appreciate you so much. And uh, it's, uh, that's been very encouraging as well, as well as the older people who may not feel like sitting as long, but they have been very encouraging also. Okay, we were talking yesterday about how that Ecclesiastes is a book of wisdom. I believe it's Solomon. And what he does is he calls us to come and listen to his experience. By inspiration, he tells us about his years out of duty, at least about mistakes that he made. And he's looking to us and saying, don't make the same mistakes. And uh, if you are looking, if you're trying to find satisfaction in life without God, just looking at that which is under the sun, looking to this world to fill your, your soul and to find the answers, human wisdom is not the answer. It is not only disappointing, it is degrading. And we talked about that yesterday. There are other avenues that men choose, that Solomon chose at different times, to try to find something that, that makes life meaningful. And one of them is this passage here in chapter 2 and verse uh, 1 beginning. Pleasure. Uh, sinful pleasure. Uh, chapter 2 and verse 1, I said in my heart, go to now. I will prove thee with mirth, therefore enjoy pleasure. And behold, this also is vanity. I said of laughter, it is mad, of mirth, what doeth it? And I sought in my heart to give myself unto wine, yet acquainting my heart with wisdom, and to lay hold on folly till I might see what was good for the sons of men, which they should do unto heaven all the days of their life. Solomon said a lot of people, himself included, Spend their time chasing after pleasure, mirth, laughter, wine. What's the old saying? Wine, women, and song. And that hadn't gone out of style as far as I can tell. Now, when you talk about women, for example, boy, I think Solomon uh, had some experience in that realm, didn't he? What does the history tell us? 700 wives and 300 concubines? I, I, every time I read that, I'm just staggered by that. A thousand? A thousand partners. Um, 
I, I, I've made the point before. I don't think if you gave me a pen and paper and offered me $10, I could write down the names of a thousand people that I know. He had a thousand wives. I don't know how he remembered their names. Maybe he didn't. Maybe it didn't matter. You're the king after all. You just have what you want. That's what Solomon said. I, I've, I've explored these avenues further than anybody that you know can go. And surely, you know, if anybody knew what it meant to be a real man and to enjoy life and the lust of the flesh, a man who had a, 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 a tribe of women that big, oh boy, he must have been the happiest man in the world. But you know, you keep reading this book, you know that ain't so. And over in the seventh chapter, Solomon makes this point. He said, I turned my heart to know and to search and to seek out by wisdom the scheme of things and to know the wickedness of folly and the foolishness that is madness. And I find something more bitter than death. And it's this, the woman whose heart is snares and nets and whose hands are fetters he who pleases God escapes her, but the sinner is taken by her. Solomon seems to be saying, I was in the latter camp. Behold, this is what I found, says the preacher. While adding one thing to another to find the scheme of things which my soul has sought repeatedly, but I have not found one man among a thousand have I found, but a woman among all these have I not found. You think that he was thinking some, about something close to home there when he talked about a thousand? If you look for a thousand women, there wouldn't be one that would make the grade. People have said, well, that's just so mean on women. And it may seem so, and maybe in some ways it is, but I, I think it really is more of an indictment about the kind of women Solomon was hanging around and the kind of women he chose. i tell you what Solomon figured out. A man's got a thousand wives, doesn't have one. Because that's not what God intended for marriage to be. And I, I think we see the same thing of today. There, there are places where polygamy is still practiced and it still doesn't work. And homosexuality doesn't work. And fornication doesn't work. We can try other ways. But I'll tell you what Solomon said, it's more bitter than death. And so this is not the way in which we're going to find happiness. Though a lot of people think this is the, the great ambition. Uh, he also talks about wine. He says in 2, 3, I decided to make myself happy with wine. You know something I've noticed, and you probably have too, people that set out to make themselves happy with wine never get there. You ever notice that? I've got a son-in-law that uh, works at uh, the downtown hospital in Birmingham. He's an x-ray tech, and he works over the weekends, and he works over there in, in the holidays and places like that. And he talks about these people that come in that have damaged themselves no little, all of it due to drugs. The, the, the lines in their faces are not made from smiling. It's not a happy life that they find. But oh, they think, man, if, it just, if I could just get that bottle or that drug or whatever it might be, happiness is surely in the bottom of that bottle. And Solomon, you remember famously in, in the Proverbs wrote that no, that's the fellow that's got woe and sorrow and strife and complaining and wounds without cause. He doesn't know where they came from. And redness of eye. Look like they're, they're about to bleed to death from their eyes. Those that tarry long over the wine and who try mixed wine. Don't be fooled, he said. At the last it bites like an adder. You will be like one who lies at the top of the mast of the sea like one who lies at the top of the master in the midst of the sea. They struck me, but I was not hurt. They beat me. I did not feel it. When shall I awake that I may, I may have another drink? I had a fellow, he works for the prison system, and he was visiting with us uh, a little while back, and he spent about 20 minutes after service one day lecturing me, or at least informing me, about the fentanyl crisis. You know, I didn't really understand the, the depth of that problem. There are all kinds of drugs. Fentanyl is now the leading killer, I guess, in America. And it's coming over the border every day, and it takes so little to destroy a human life, to ruin a human life. Now, Solomon said something very interesting about his uh, explorations with alcohol. He said over here that uh, he had... Uh, um, 
verse uh, 3 it is of chapter 2. We read a moment ago. I, I sought in my heart to give myself unto wine, yet acquainting my heart with wisdom. I think what he's saying there, I was able to take this up and try it and experiment with it, but control myself. The problem is there are a lot of folks who cannot control themselves when they try it. They can't even abuse it and lay it down. Once they start, it owns them. There's the old saying that we've heard. First, the drink takes a drink, and then uh, first the man takes a drink, and then the drink takes a drink, and then the drink takes a man. We understand what that means. I, I take that first drink. I made that choice, but pretty soon that drink starts drinking. And then before it's all over with, I'm owned. And sometimes the first try is where that that process begins. And uh, for you young people, if you have any doubt about that, ask these older folks here, because I doubt there are any of us that do not know, and some folks in our family, folks that we love very much, who have been owned by alcohol or some other drug. And it leads them down a path that you never thought they would go, and respectable and good people do things so shameful and so degrading. If you've ever seen that, you've seen enough to know exactly what Solomon was saying. And yet there are people who really believe this is what will, this is what will make me happy or at least help me forget. It will help me with my problems. It never does. Another thing that Solomon saw as a dead end that's still popular today is just plain old materialism. In this sense, I mean the love of things and possessions. If you turn with me over to chapter 2, this time we'll look in verse 4. Solomon recounts how that he said, I made great works. I built me houses and planted me vineyards. And I made gardens and orchards. And I planted trees in them of all kinds of fruits. I made pools of water. The water wherewith the wood that brings forth the trees. And I got servants and maidens. And servants born in my house, and I had great possessions and great cattle, small and great, among all that were in Jerusalem. He said, more than anybody else, I had things. I gathered silver and gold, verse 8, and peculiar treasure of kings and of the provinces. And I got me men singers and women singers, and the delights of the sons of men, musical instruments, the King James says, and all sorts. I was great and increased more than all that were before me in Jerusalem. Also my wisdom remained with me. Surely here's a man who is on his way to happiness. Look at all the money he's got. And Solomon had money. You go back to the, uh, to the history. And uh, it's just hard for me really to, to fathom the kind of wealth that comes with Solomon. Uh, gold that came to Solomon in one year. According to this modern speech translation, was 50,000 pounds of gold a year, plus that which came from the merchants, plus traders' profits, plus tribute, plus, plus. I don't know what that would be in, in uh, the modern equivalent of, of our currency, but it would be a fabulous amount of wealth. Sometimes you can tell more about the amount, how rich a fellow is, by the things that he has or buys. You know, there's a section that talks about how much food Solomon prepared every day on his table. Uh, you have here in, in verse 18, one of those interesting details to me. He describes Solomon's throne. And he says that the king also made a large ivory throne and covered it with fine gold. Had six steps and all the... He said there was nothing like it in any other kingdom. And I, I remember as a young student reading that and wondering, you know, here's a man who who has an ivory throne carved. That would be some money. But then, not satisfied with that, he covers it with gold. Now I said, why what would a guy do that? Why would you, you have an ivory throne carved and cover it with gold? You could, you could overlay a wooden throne with gold. Well, I think the answer to that is simple enough. Just because you can just because you can, because you're Solomon and you're the man and you've got more money than anybody else got and you've got more money to know what you do with. And so that's what you do. Solomon said it himself in chapter 2 and verse 10. He said, if something appealed to me, I did it. I allowed myself to have any pleasure I wanted since I found pleasure in my work. 
This was my reward for all my hard work. Uh, why does a guy need a $25,000 Rolex? Don't they still sell Timexes? Don't they tell time? Well, we understand the answer to that. And that's the, there's nothing new about that. And, and people think that uh, that kind of conspicuous consumption will uh, somehow make them feel on top of things and that will solve things. You know, we, the Lord told Moses 400 years earlier, uh, king ought not to do that. He ought not to, to collect wives or gold. They both would destroy him. But uh, in Solomon's case, he didn't make him happy. And in verse 11 of this same second chapter, I looked on all the works that my hands had wrought and on the labor that I had labored to do. And behold, all was vanity and vexation of spirit. It was empty. It was unprofitable. It was useless, he said. I turned myself to behold wisdom and madness and folly. What can a man do that comes after the king? Even that which hath been done already. And then I saw that wisdom excels folly as far as light excels darkness. He said, I, I, I believe this. I believe it's still better to be wise. It's better to know things. Ignorance is not a virtue. He said, the wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. At least the wise man knows where he's going. But he said, I'll tell you this too. One event happens to them all. They all die. And they might be buried in the same cemetery side by side. And there's no remembrance, verse 16, of the wise more than of the fool, seeing that that which now is and the days to come shall be all forgotten. And how dies the wise man as the fool? And he said something, verse 17, very striking. He said, therefore, because of this, because of the fact that this life it ends and we leave everything behind. He said, I hated life. Because the work that is wrought under the sun is grievous unto me for all is vanity and vexation of spirit. Yea, I hated all my labor that I had taken under the sun because I should leave it unto the man that should be hereafter. And who knows whether he'll be a wise man or a fool. If I'm right that this is Solomon, that didn't say much for Rehoboam, did it? But that's the way he felt. He said, there was a point in time and I was away from God and treasures were everything to me. And then, I don't know, maybe he got older. Uh, maybe it began to dawn on him, as it will as you get older, that our long range plans are getting shorter and shorter. And it may be that he, at that moment, saw how empty it all was. And he said, I hated life. Now, over in 1 Chronicles chapter 29, I find it interesting to, to compare the two. You know, David, when he came to the end of his life, he was going to leave it all behind too. But it wasn't his life what he was leaving behind. And, you know, he, he speaks and he says to the people, now look, I wanted to, um, I wanted to build the temple. God wouldn't let me. So Solomon's going to build it, and we've gathered the funds to do this, and we've, and he said, uh, I want you to be strong, Solomon. I want you to help him to the people. And then in verse chapter 29 and verse 11, he prays this prayer that's just a great model for how to pray and how to praise God. Thine, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty. All that is in the heaven and the earth is thine. Thine is the kingdom, O Lord. And thou art exalted as head above all. Riches and glory and honor come of thee. And thou reignest over all. In thine hand is power and might. In thine hand it is to make great and to give strength to all. Now therefore, our God, we thank thee and praise thy glorious name. David's not exactly hating life. Well, David's life wasn't wrapped up in things. Let me say this to the... Young folks here, I know you've heard this, but listen to Solomon. If you want to live a life in which if you achieve your goals, you will hate life anyway, then chase things. I can't think of a quicker way.
to despair than that. You know, Solomon has a lot to say about that in chapter 5. And again, time's getting away from us. But in chapter 5, you know, he tells us, whoever loves silver uh, will never be satisfied with silver. If you love things, you will never have enough. Count on it. When goods are increased, they're increased that eat them. The more you've got coming in, the more it seems it goes out. And what's the point? The sleep of the laboring man is sweet. Whether he eat little or much, but the abundance of the rich will not suffer him to sleep. It's that old point. The more things we possess, as one man put it, the more things possess us. Now you check your heart and see if that's not true. The more things I've got to buy insurance for and lock up and check on and paint and repair, and the more things I possess, the more tied I am to this world. And yet we think if we get more things, that's the secret to happiness. Solomon said, I had more things than you can ever dream of, and it didn't work for me. You don't know what's going to happen to him after you die. We already saw a passage about that. And he said, I'll tell you this, that when you leave this earth, you leave it all behind. So there are a number of dead-end roads, actually, that Solomon warns us about. But, so, but Ecclesiastes is so much more than that. And uh, I want to spend just a minute looking at some of the things that Solomon says are necessary and are tied to success in life. And the most obvious one is you're going to have to give God his proper place. We start with the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man, the whole of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment with every secret thing, whether it be good or whether it be evil. It is the fundamental. If we're going to find happiness in life, we're going to have to give God his place. We've never lived in a time in our society where it is more cool to be an atheist than it is now. People think that it's sophisticated and smart uh, and that you can, just, uh, uh, you can just smell the arrogance of those who look down on people who believe in God uh, as ignorant and backwater and those who use thought and reason why atheism is the way Richard Dawkins, one of the celebrity atheists, we'll mention him again in just a minute, wrote a book a few years ago called The Blind Watchmaker, in which he wrote, despite all appearances to the contrary, there is no watchmaker in nature beyond the blind forces of physics. Um, he uh, said that uh, Darwin has proved that. <laughs> and if uh, it can be said to play any role, uh, why... Really, nature is just a blind watchmaker. And I, I thought, I'm not as smart as Richard Dawkins, but I think he, he, he really mistitled this book. Instead of titling it The Blind Watchmaker, he should have titled it The Watch That Made Itself. That's really what he believes. He believes that there's a watch that made itself. I, that doesn't make sense uh, with a literal watch, much less with the whole universe. And the point's been made many times. If you see a watch, I don't care how cheap it is, how ornate it is, if it doesn't have a name on it. One thing I guarantee you, somebody made that watch. You know, the existence of things demands a creator. Creatures demand a creator. Life demands a living creator. As the Hebrew writer said, every house is built by somebody, and the one that made all things is God. That is an unanswerable argument, it seems to me. Atheism is the most indefensible philosophical position a man could hold. Uh, this fellow named John Lennox, he was a professor at, uh, uh, at uh, Oxford, one of the colleges at Oxford, for years. I think he's retired now. But uh, he's a believer, and he made the point. He said there are not many options when you think about it, just two. Either human intelligence ultimately owes its origin to mindless matter, or there's a creator. It's strange that some people claim that it's their intelligence that leads them to prefer the first to the second. That is a good point. Why is it that so many smart people hold such a foolish view? And it is a foolish view. Well, I think going back to our text, it has something to do, everything to do in many cases, 
with the next statements. Fear God. Secondly, keep His commandments. For this is the whole of man. God will bring every work into judgment. Maybe this is not 100% true, but it's true many times. The reason why people are so ready to reject God is because they do not want to keep His commandments and they do not want to face judgment. I think it's no more complicated than that. Lee Strobel wrote a book on Christian evidences that you may have read. I think he was an old newspaper editor. I've I've known just a couple of newspaper editors. Newspapers are sort of out of style now, but in the day, uh, and I never did meet an editor that wasn't sort of a crusty old guy, you know. And uh, hard-boiled, and I think that fit Strobel. He, by his own admission, for years, he wasn't a nice guy, wasn't nice to his family, cheated on his wife, did a lot of evil things. And then he came to believe in Christ, and he admitted uh, in his writings, he said, I was more than happy to latch on to Darwinism as an excuse to jettison the idea of God so I could unabashedly pursue my own agenda without moral constraints. If you want to live a life of drunkenness and fornication and stealing and uh, might makes right, well, it's very convenient to get rid of God, get rid of judgment, get rid of the Bible. We had a kid there where I'm a member that a number of years ago, a young man, that when he got on his own, he announced he was an atheist and quit coming. And um, went out to see him and talk to him and try to reason with him. He didn't have any answers. But he didn't say it in so many words. But basically the point was, uh, it's just too much work to be a Christian, serve God. You've got to live your life for God. You've got to give up a lot of things. And so many other people are going this way, I think I'll just go with them. And you try to appeal to a guy like that and say, yeah, they're all going that way, but where are they going? It's heartbreaking. Some people don't jettison the idea of higher being. They embrace what's known as the new age. This is another substitute for God. The new age, um, which is just sort of warmed over paganism, best I can tell. And you think, well, that's sort of silly, and who believes that? A lot of people believe that. I was in a used bookstore in Birmingham, And uh, I was over here at this shelf, and not far away were a couple of guys who were over in some sort of a New Age section where there were all kind of talismans and uh, good luck charms and spell books and all kind of stuff, and you think, is this real? So any of these two young guys are over here, and they're just, they're about to leave, and as they're leaving, one says to his friend, he says, you think any of this really works? And the guy says, well, uh, I put a protection spell on my car one time and it worked. I started chasing them down and I thought, well, I don't know. Maybe I wish I had. Uh, there are really people that believe this. This, this book, uh, this woman wrote about the universe has your back. So millions of copies. The universe has your back. Can you think of anything more inane than that? What is the universe? The universe is gas and dust and rocks It doesn't have anybody's back. I think, to be fair, what she means is there's a force out of the universe. It's God, but not that God. This God agrees with me about everything. And this God just supports me in whatever I want to do. Okay. As one fellow said, it's about like getting a pet rock for a a, a guard dog. Uh, The universe will protect us. In Acts 17, Paul said, You need to know the God that made the worlds and all things that are therein. He's Lord of heaven and earth. He dwells not in temples made with hands, neither is worship with men's hands as though he needed anything. He gives life and breath to all things. He's made of one blood all nations of men to dwell on the face of the earth and is determined before, he says, their times and their habitation. And he's made us that we might seek him and find him, feeling after him. He's not far from every one of us. In him we live and move and have our being. Even one of the Greek poets had said, we are his offspring. 
That's exactly the God I'm talking about, Paul said. As much as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think of God as somehow subhuman. That doesn't make any sense. The times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commands all men everywhere to repent because he has appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness. By that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance, and that he hath raised him from the dead. The truth is that until we come to terms with our Creator, who made us to seek Him, that we might obey Him, then there can't be any, any fulfillment or satisfaction in life. And by the way, that is for our good. I, years ago, I heard Brother Lee, Irvin Lee, preaching, and he made the point in the audience, he said, you know, I have not had a new Bible for several decades, he said, that when I first got it, I did not go and underline Deuteronomy 6, 24. And at the time, I was pretty new to Bible reading. I had no idea what that said. So I flipped over there to find out. And this is what it says. Moses reminded Israel that God has commanded all these things for our good always. That's a key point to remember. God's way is the best way. Not fornication, not drunkenness. Not, uh, not the uh, asceticism of this world, but God's way. Something else that uh, I think is important in a well-lived life is not only trusting God's word, but trusting his providence. That passage in chapter 3 and verse 1 that is so oftentimes quoted and referred to, to everything there is a purpose, a season, and every purpose under heaven. Time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down, a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn, a time to dance. A time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones. And a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. And a time to get and a time to lose and a time to keep and a time to cast away and a time to rend and a time to sow and a time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war, a time of peace. Several years ago, there was a hippie group out in California that made a song about this, some anti-war song. I don't think they had any clue what this passage was about. And uh, I, I think a lot of people that quote it really don't think about its context. What does he mean by this? Well, as one fellow said, I don't think that this passage is so much prescriptive as it is descriptive. And I believe that's right. What he meant by that is this passage is not designed for us to read and find out, oh, today is either a time to break down or a time to uh, dance. Which one is it? Today? I don't think that's the point, is it? Look with me in verse 9. After this list, Solomon adds, What profit hath he that works that wherein he laboreth? We've seen that question before. We saw that over in the very first part of this work. Back in chapter 1, Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. What profit hath the man of all his labor under the sun? And I think the question is the same. It's phrased a little differently. But his point in chapter 1 was, when you look at life under the sun and all the things that go on, if this is all there is, where's the prophet? And here, I think he enumerates life in these terms. It's one step forward and one step back, and you're up and you're down, and life just seems to be this maze of all kinds of experiences. And he asked the same question, what profit is there in all this? And what sense are we to make of it? And I think in answering that, if you continue here in chapter 3 and look at verse 16, uh, Solomon comes to this point. You know, life is full of a lot of experiences. And some of them just don't seem at all fair. Moreover, I saw under the sun the place of judgment, that wickedness was there, and the place of righteousness, that iniquity was there. And I said in my heart, God shall judge the righteous and the wicked. For there is a time for every purpose and for every work. There's a purpose for everything. What Solomon teaches me is you've got to see God working in those things. You've got to understand that God's providence 
is active and involved in this life. Learn to trust him through the ups and downs of this life. Because his hand is working. Over in the fifth chapter, there are some who have different views of this passage, but I like the old King James rendering here. If thou seest the oppression of poor and the violent perverting of judgment and justice in a province, marvel not at the matter. For he that is higher than the highest regardeth, and there be higher than they. I do think that's a reference to God. And I think it answers the question. You may have had people ask you, well, if there's a God, why doesn't he deal with all this meanness in the world? And your answer is, he's going to. By the way, you sure you want him to start dealing with meanness today? Where are you standing? How are you doing today? Yes, if, if we were in God's place, we might make other decisions. I'm sure we wouldn't get it right. That's Job's lesson, isn't it? But the point is here, trust God's providence. In 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 9, it's a great lesson. After talking about how that uh, the judgment of God has fallen through history, God is always taking care of His own. The Lord knows how to deliver the godly out of temptation and reserve the unjust on the day of judgment to be punished. This is the passage that gives us hope. i got three grandsons growing up in this world. Uh, I'm like you. I think every day about the meanness of this world and about how our society seems to be going down and down and what's going to happen. I don't know. I don't know what God's plan is. Maybe His plan is to take it all the way down. His will be done. But I know this, that God will take care of His own. He didn't say you're going to enjoy what's coming, but He said, I'll take care of you. I think one of the great advantages, trust God's word, trust God's providence. That'll help us live this life with peace. We also need to take responsibility for ourselves. Uh, over in the ninth chapter and verse 11, there's a passage sometimes that's referred to. Um, we do hear this passage uh, quoted along and along. I returned, saw unto the sun that the race is not to the swift, nor the battle to the strong, nor bread to the wise, nor yet riches to men of understanding, nor yet favor to men of skill. It just seems like the world's filled with injustice, and time and chance happens to them all. For man also knoweth not his time. <coughs> As fishes are caught in an evil net, birds caught in a snare, so the sons of men are snared in evil time when it falls suddenly upon them. If I understand this section, you know, sometimes those who write about Ecclesiastes see this section as just sort of a jumble of various uh, wisdom teachings just put together uh, without any kind of connection. Well, obviously, that's not true. I think there's certainly an idea that, that Solomon has and the Holy Spirit has in giving us these things. And I think he starts off here in verse 11 by pointing out that a lot of people under the sun think about life as being unfair and random. Just time and chance. That's my problem. That's what's happened to me. And I think the point that Solomon makes is to get people to think more close to home about the decisions they make. For example, verse 13 of chapter 9, if you have your Bible open. This is the wisdom that I have seen also under the sun. It seemed great to me. There was a little city and few men within it. And there came a great king against it and besieged it and built great bulwarks against it. And there was found in it a poor wise man and he by his wisdom delivered the city. And yet no man remembered that same poor man. And I said... Wisdom is better than strength. Nevertheless, the poor man's wisdom is despised and his words are not heard. And by the way, what do you suppose is going to happen the next time that army comes against the city and the wise man is not there? I'll tell you what some people will say when that happens. They'll say, we just weren't lucky. The stars weren't with us. It just wasn't our day. It's not fair. What Solomon said is, it really comes down to whether or not you listen to wisdom and respect wisdom. Don't blame bad luck for your problems. Think about your choices and what you do in life. And that's where the 10th chapter comes in. Dead flies cause the ointment of the apothecary to send forth a stinking savor. 
So doth a little folly, him that is a reputation for wisdom and honor. He said, what you ought to do is consider the fact that the choices you make, just a little folly, will be enough to affect your life in a terrible way. How many flies does it take to ruin perfume? How much sin does it take to mar your reputation and to ruin your life? How many bad choices does it take? Look to yourself. Don't sit around blaming fate and bad luck or anything else. Look to the choices that you make. And if we had more time, we'd go through the whole list. There's a lot of great things in this passage that I think great lessons that reinforce this fact. Make good choices and don't make excuses. Uh, we also find, I think, a, a call to generosity in chapter 11. Cast your bread upon the waters, and thou shalt find it after many days. Uh, there are all kinds of discussions and maybe ideas about exactly what that figure means. But one thing seems to be clear. It suggests the idea of to gain you give away. That you're blessed by sharing. And that seems to be clear. And that certainly is a Bible principle, isn't it? The New Testament teaches that. Paul said, the Lord taught, it's more blessed to give than to receive. 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 1. If you want to have a happy life, learn to give. He gives the example there. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. I'm no, I don't know enough to be too critical of these translators. But, but, but the word there uh, is, uh, is really to them. Uh, God has uh, given grace to and through the churches of Macedonia. In a severe test of affliction, the, their abundance of their joy and their extreme poverty have uh, overflowed in the wealth of generosity to their part. For they gave according to their means, as I can testify, and beyond their means. They begged us to take. We felt badly about taking from these people. But they said, please, let us help those who are in need, when they themselves were not well off. These are people who have learned to give themselves to God. And that's what motivated them to be able to give to their brethren. When I look at a passage like Luke chapter 12, Jesus calls us to sell what we have and give, that we might have treasure in heaven. That's where our heart is. Where our treasure is, our heart will be also. In Luke 14, he said, real charity is helping people that can't help you back. I thought Stephen said it so well in the prayer. There's not one thing that we have the Lord needs. And I'll tell you this. Until I learn how to give to people that cannot help me in any way, that have nothing that I need, that cannot benefit me, but do it cheerfully just because I love them, then I'll never know the Spirit of God. When Peter talked about taking on the divine nature, surely charity is an essential part of being like Christ. Proverbs chapter 19 and verse 17, the man who has pity on the poor lends to the Lord, or as the Lord himself would later say, as you help those folks in prison and those folks that were sick, you helped me. You want to lead a life that's worthwhile, learn how to give like God gives. Seven or eight, <laughs> that's a superlative, isn't it? Seven is sort of the full number. We'll go beyond that. There's a great old saying. I think this is a saying of John Wesley's. I've heard it quoted along and along. Do all you can in all the ways you can, to all the souls you can, in every place you can, at all times you can, with all the zeal you can, ever as long as you can. Let that be your spirit. If you want to find joy in life, if you want to be blessed, be a blessing. And I think that's exactly what Solomon is teaching us here. And he says, don't let what might happen stop you. In fact, let it motivate you. Well, I don't want to give today because it might be taken away from me. Things may get hard. That's all the more reason to use it now. Because once it's taken away, we can't use it. So he says, if you want to find joy and happiness, find it in that fulfillment. 
he talks about how that, uh, that clouds are full of rain, not to keep it, but to give it away. There are some people that are full clouds. You remember about Tabitha Dorcas. She's called um, this great woman was a woman filled with good works. That's what the Holy Spirit said through Luke. And when she died, people just couldn't say enough about all that she had done for them. There are some people like that. They're full clouds and they give away. And then you have also the picture in our passage of fallen trees. Once a tree falls, there it is. For better or worse, there is obviously a too late. And at that point, all of our opportunities are gone. I hope those two images motivate all of us as we wake up every morning and we think today is our day to be a blessing to other people. And God has blessed us and we're the clouds that are called on to help other people. I know there are folks in this room. I don't know everybody here. I'm sure I don't know everybody here. But I know that there are folks in this room. Some folks have been talking good about you behind your back who are those kind of people. They are a blessing to others. I hope I can be that kind of blessing to other people. When people are in need, they're there to help in whatever way they can. And I hope I also remember that there's a day coming when my opportunities to do such will be over. One more thing I want to mention as we close. You know, I think Solomon teaches us that not only do we need to trust God's word and trust his providence, and stop making excuses and start making good choices and, and look to other people with the kind of love that God calls on us, God has for us. But we also need in that process to learn to enjoy life. In chapter 2 and verse 24, Solomon writes, There is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and enjoy his life or enjoy, find enjoyment in his toil, this translation says. This also I saw is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? For the one who pleases God, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. Not the sinner, but to those that are his. God has given the privilege to enjoy this life. Uh, and again, it may be that I'm the only guy in this room that needs this lesson. But I've admitted before, before audiences, that I have, at least in the past, tended to live my life like I drive my car. I don't drive fast. I don't drive recklessly. But I'll tell you how I drive. I drive and I'm looking at the center line, and my mind is a million miles away. I'm not seeing one thing that's, that I'm passing. And if you wave to me, and I don't wave back, join the crowd, because I didn't see you. I'm not mad at you. I just didn't see you. I'm thinking about the next thing. And I think, I, and at least in the past, I have lived my life that way, thinking about the next thing. Okay, we've got this, and next we've got to ready for that. The next week, something else coming up. And then, what's next? And I'll tell you the problem with that. You miss life that way if you're not careful. You can miss your kids growing up. You can miss a relationship with your wife. You can miss today, tonight. And if I understand it, that's exactly what Solomon is warning us again. He's saying you've got to remember to enjoy life as a gift of God. He doesn't just say that one time. When you start looking for it, I'm sure you may have noticed this before, it's just scattered through the book. Uh, I perceive, chapter 3, that there's nothing better for them to be joyful, to do good as long as they live, to eat and drink and take pleasure and toil. This is man's gift to God. People say this is a contradiction. He says, vanity of vanities. He turns around and says, enjoy life. No, it's not a contradiction. He's talking to two different people. To the man for whom this life is all there is, there is no joy. But for the man who takes life as a gift of God, there is joy every day in simple things, in big things. 8, 5, uh, 8.15, 
I commend joy. A man has nothing better under the sun but to eat and drink and to be joyful. For this will go with him in his toil through the days of his life that God has given him under the sun. Or in chapter 9. Eat your bread with gladness. Drink your wine with a merry heart. God has accepted your deeds. Let your clothes be white. Do not spare oil on your head. Live joyfully with the wife of your youth. You love all the days of your feeding life. Don't, don't go to bed tonight without telling your wife you love her. You know, don't, don't fail to look at her. Don't, don't be so busy and wrapped up in things that you forget to, to, to hug your kids or to call your dad or your mom. Don't forget to enjoy the things that really matter in life. That's a part of what Ecclesiastes, that's wisdom literature. This is your portion in life. That passage in chapter 11, uh, beginning and I think going through into chapter 12, the light is sweet, it's pleasant for the eyes to see the sun. I can't tell you how many days that I have never looked up. I never saw the clouds, never smelled the flowers. I'm busy, I think. I'm wrapped up and my mind is occupied. It's a bad way to live. Somebody said, here are the three R's that young people need. Rejoice, young man, in your childhood and let your heart cheer you in the days of your youth and walk in the ways of your heart and the sight of your eyes, but know that for all these things God will bring you into judgment. I don't think he's sarcastic there. I think he's saying there is a judgment. But nevertheless, enjoy, rejoice in your life. And remove, he says in verse 10, anxiety from your heart and cast off distress from your body. And then in chapter 12, remember your creator in the days of your youth. Those are the three R's. <laughs> rejoice, remove, remember God. Young people ought to enjoy their life. I remember an old wise man, he said, you know, sometimes old people get cranky about young folks, you know, and their activities, not sinful activities, but just they're busy and active and, and uh, they'll say to young people, act your age. He said, we don't mean act your age, we mean act our age. They're not our age. And there's a time to rejoice. And there's a time to be free from the kinds of burdens and cares. But there certainly is time to remember God as well. All of us need to be thankful for life as the gift of God. And I think Paul's example is a great one. Paul wrote to the Philippians that in whatever state he was in, he had learned to be content. I know what it is to live with humble means, he wrote. And I know what it is to live in prosperity in every circumstance. I've learned the secret of contentment. And guess what that secret is? Christ. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. As, a, as an ungodly man, you got to get more, you got to get more. I don't have enough. What might happen tomorrow? But for a man like Paul, when he had too little, he knew it was temporary. And he knew also that uh, he, it would be a good chance to exercise that patience we've been praying for. And he also knew that it would help him to appreciate in future times how to sympathize with people who are hurting. And when he had more than enough, he recognized it as a gift of God. It never was his life. It could be gone tomorrow. While it's here, let's enjoy it. And let's give God the praise for it. I think that's a key point in the secret to a happy, fulfilled life. I'll close with this. Uh, I may have shared this illustration with some of you before. But several years ago, our man Richard Dawkins, again, you remember the guy who thinks the watch made itself? Dawkins is a celebrity atheist, and his group, somebody described Richard Dawkins this way. They said, Richard Dawkins' philosophy is, I don't believe in God, and I hate him. You never saw a guy who was more engaged in fighting against somebody he claims doesn't exist than Richard Dawkins. So anyway, Richard Dawkins several years ago is a Brit, and he's uh, over there in London, and he and his group get together money, 
and they put these placards on London buses. And uh, this is the way it read. There's probably no God. Now stop worrying and enjoy your life. Now, I might ask this audience, uh, is there a word that jumps out at you there? <laughs> I'm going to ask you to answer out, but, but if you're like me, the, answer, the word probably stands out. There's probably no God. There's probably no hell. Probably. Here, why don't you drink this? It's not poison. Probably. Hard pass. But that's not the word that I want to notice right now. The word I want to notice is the word enjoy. Because I think once we understand what Solomon said, we know how foolish it is to think you can enjoy anything without God. You can be distracted for a while. You can stay drunk for several days. But the only joy in life is found in getting in line with your creator. That's what we tried to say from Proverbs. The real, I think, fundamental, basic definition of wisdom is learning to get in line with the will of the one that made us. And that's what God calls you to, to come and to be his own. He's so merciful that though he doesn't need anything that I've got, he's willing to take me in to forgive me at his cost. If I just have the humility to admit I need it and come and confess his son, leave the old sinful life behind, I can be baptized into Christ and raised to walk a new man. If you haven't done that, you need to, and I hope you will, even tonight. If you're here as a Christian and you have forgotten what's important in life and you've gotten mixed up in this world, and by the way, it's really easy to do, but it's a terrible mistake to make. It's the worst mistake to make. I hope tonight it'll be your desire, your action to come forward and help, let us help you any way we can to get right with him pray with you to make public confession of public sin whatever we can do to help you and assist you in making things right with God let us know how we can do that we're going to sing a song will you come now while we stand while we sing